Um, what's the name of the guy with the clotting disorder? Jason McGrady. He was at UVA. He, he was sent home a few days ago. But he's home recovering. They said it would be a slow, long recovery. Okay, we pray for Jason. All right, Awaken, Lord My Heart. He'll take that song in the book. I think it's the second song in the book there. In alphabetical order. Awaken, Lord My Heart, reveal thyself to me. I was thinking about the song this week as I was looking at this new lesson. And I hope that it will be an encouragement to you as we look at 2 Peter. 2 Peter, awaken, Lord, my heart. Hope you remember this one. If not, uh, maybe after the first verse, just come back to your memory, right? Don't worry. Like that last phrase in each verse, my slumbering spirit rounds, right? have a study guide if you have a new study guide the family of like precious faith if not robin will get you one quickly I encourage you to encourage you to follow along as we study through this series second peter in your bible second peter just three brief chapters but it is jam-packed with some tremendous truths that i hope will be an encouragement to you today we'll just look at kind of a brief overview and then hopefully we're willing over the next couple of months next three months or so we will unpack some of its truths and allow the Lord to apply them to our lives. Second Peter, we won't take time to read it. I encourage you this week, if you would, to read it through. Let me encourage you to do something perhaps this week as you look into lesson one. Um, maybe try to carve out some time to read through it in one sitting. It's kind of one letter um, and it goes together. So you'll, um, you'll appreciate uh, the opportunity if you can to read it together. It makes it much more cohesive. It really only takes a kind of time myself 
It takes about 15 or 20 minutes to read it through um, if you don't pause too many times, um, but it will uh, be an encouragement and blessing to you. So let's look at some things this morning as we look at this book. Um, it is one of the later New Testament epistles. Um, Peter had done some maturing, I was thinking, as he introduces himself in the very first two words of the letter, Simon Peter. He had done some maturing along the way, hadn't he? And we'll look at that here briefly this morning as well. Um, he writes some things that I think can be an encouragement to us as well. You'll notice in your Bible, those of you that are astute mathematicians, that 2 Peter follows a similarly named book, 1 Peter. Um, the book of 1 Peter was written to some Christians, Jews in particular, that were under some severe persecution. Anything we endure today doesn't even hold a candle to the things that they had to endure in those days. And then Peter's writing this second book kind of along the same lines, along the same vein, but with some slightly different emphases. Um, and so keep that in mind of the audience as we read it. I thought as I, I don't know how your Bible is arranged, but I have 1 Peter chapter 5 on the same page in my Bible as 2 Peter begins. And at the very top of that page, I have underlined a familiar verse, verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 5, casting all your care upon him. We need to do that today, don't we? Amen. Last week we studied Psalm 37. We can find ourselves in fretting ourselves because of evildoers. The psalmist says, fret not thyself. This verse reminds us as well, casting all your cares. That's not the lesson this morning, but I thought maybe that would encourage you along the way. So let's look at these four kind of summary ideas this morning as we look at this book of 2 Peter, the family of like precious faith. Number one, consider this with me, and we'll read verse one in just a moment, the who, Simon Peter. Who, Simon Peter. Look at your Bible, <clears throat> you'll notice um, most every epistle begins <clears throat> not, not similarly to the way we write letters, we just sign our name at the end. In these days, they wrote at the beginning um, who it was from, for a couple of reasons, one of which was strictly pragmatic, um, they often wrote on papyrus or scrolls, and it took quite some effort to reach the end, right? You couldn't simply swipe up, Miss Rachel, right? You had to turn pages, remember those dark days? Unroll. Or unroll a scroll. There was no swiping, there was no pinching to see who wrote it, and there was no send line on the email. How about that, Chuck? You, there was no from, you know? You had to read the letter. Revolutionary thought, anyway. Um, so they often introduce themselves, but there's some meaning here that I think we should consider this morning. Look at verse 1 with me. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith, that's the title of our series, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I like the inclusiveness of verse 1. He says, to them that have obtained like precious faith, with us us. He introduces himself as a servant. He had become a servant. Uh, he had, had to learn some humility, and he had stubbed his toe a few times, not unlike some of us as Christians, right? And then he says an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was a witness of these things, and we'll find that in chapter 1, familiar verse there, about halfway through chapter 1, where he says, I was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and yet he includes me. He includes you as someone who's found that like precious faith. Aren't you glad we're all saved the same way? Amen. Amen. Peter and James and John, the other disciples, the apostles, had some special privileges. They witnessed Jesus Christ in the flesh, but Peter reminds us that we're all saved the same way. His blood still saves some 2,000 years later, just like it had to do for Peter, just like it had to do for James and John and Matthew and all the rest, so it saves us. And I'm glad for the inclusiveness of verse 1. But let's take a, just a few moments to look at this man, uh, Peter. You'll notice he introduces himself in the very first two words as Simon Peter. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, if you will, to Matthew chapter 16. God, throughout Scripture, changes people's names when their lives change. We won't take time to look at it this morning, but perhaps you can go back some time and look at Abram change to Abraham. Jacob, boy, aren't you glad if you're in Jacob's shoes, aren't you glad God changed his name from supplanter, deceiver, conniver, to Israel, a prince with God. Not just a name change, but a change in their character that merited that change, and some others as well. This is no different. His given name is Simon. Um, you'll remember from the calling in the book of John, and it's recorded in Mark as well, that his name was Simon, brother Andrew there. And look here at this passage in Matthew chapter 16. We'll find out a little bit about his name change. This is kind of the, the foundational verse for the church, functionally and foundationally, as Jesus asks his disciples these questions. Then verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, 
Blessed art thou, look here, Simon Barjona. We'll talk about that in just a moment. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Here comes the name change in verse 18. And I say unto, also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In verse 17, Jesus refers to him as Simon Barjona. Simon is the Greek or New Testament version, version of the Old Testament name is Simeon. Um, one of Jacob's sons was named Simeon. One of the tribes of Israel is named after him. Simeon, you'll find his name appearing also in the birth of Christ, right? Uh, one of those in the temple who was a key participant. Simeon means hearing or I have heard. Isn't that interesting? One of the things that Peter had to learn was to listen before he spoke, right? I think as he introduces himself as Simon, or Simeon, perhaps he's reminding himself that, Lord, thank you for helping me learn to listen. Remember, he was very impetuous, right? Yeah. And we, we applaud his energy, right? He was a go-getter. I mean, if you said jump, he asked how high on the way up, right? But sometimes he got a little bit ahead. Remember, Jesus was patiently, at the end of the book of John, trying to explain to his disciples what was going to happen. This is God's eternal plan. I'm going to the cross. Yeah. I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be tried, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. And almost before Jesus gets finished explaining what's going to happen, no, I'll never let that happen, right? We know that he denied Christ three times afterwards. Although, all men may leave me, but not me. Well, Peter, you need to listen first, right? Jesus had told him this would happen, and yet in the garden, when the soldiers come, the man that comes with Judas, when they come, Peter's the first one out with the sword, right? Whack off the ear. Fortunately, it was just the ear. Jesus healed him, but off with the ear of the high priest's servant. Peter, you need to listen. This is part of God's eternal plan. So I find in his name some interesting things that encourage me. One of the reasons we study God's word is for us to listen to the spirit of God speak to us through his word. So he introduces himself as Simon. And then notice here in verse 17 as well, uh, his surname, or perhaps we would call it today our last name or family name, Bar-Jonah. It's very simply defined as son of bar means son of jonah his father's name was jonah same um, kind of arrangement several other places in scripture as i looked at that i was reminded you can turn there if you want over to matthew chapter 26 and i don't probably have mentioned this to you before but i think it bears witness or bears reference again matthew chapter 27 there's another bar mentioned in scripture matthew 27 verse 16 in the crucifixion of Christ, remember Pilate in his great striving for political correctness. I won't say what political party he may have been associated with, but anyway, we'll let Mr. Campbell tell you <laughs> who Pilate was associated with, right? But he thinks I'll make a deal with the Jews, right? There's a mob, well, I don't, let me get too far straight here, but there's a mob, there's a riot, so instead of quelling the riot, let's see if we can appease them. Boy. Does that sound strange to you or very familiar, right? That's Pilate. So, okay, well, here we go. Here's a bad dude. I'll offer him instead of Jesus. Here it is, Matthew 27, 16. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. We often say it that way together, but it's actually a compound name just like Barjona. It's Bar-Abbas, which means son of the father. And here's a great exchange. I'm encouraged every time I think about this. When I see Peter's name, Barjona, I think about Bar Abbas. The son of the father was allowed to go free because the only begotten son stood in his place. The truth is, all of us are Barabbas, right? We get to be the son of the father because his only begotten son took our place. Right. So... Barabbas is not, you know, sometimes we use his name in a rather derogatory fashion. He was allowed to go free and Jesus died, but you know what? We're all Barabbas. We're all the son of the father. We all are adopted as his sons because we are allowed to go free when Jesus takes our place. Amen. So I know that's a, a bit of a trail from Simon's name there in the book of 2 Peter, but I hope that'll be an encouragement to you. No matter what happens in our world, in our society, no matter what kind of restrictions or persecution or whatever name you want to call it, you may have to go under. Remember, Jesus took your place. He took my place. I am, Brother Cliff, Barabbas. That's right. Barabbas was allowed to go free that day. I've often wondered, you know, we don't know any more about him. There's some historians, Josephus and others, that have 
uh, given some accounts about Barabbas, but none of them have much veracity, and none of them have been um, very well vetted or verified, so we don't know. We won't know until eternity, but I wonder, I just wonder if Barabbas realized sometime after the fact, after the riot had gone away, after the crucifixion was complete, after the resurrection was noised abroad, I wonder if Barabbas, this notable prisoner, became a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be a great victory for grace? Yeah. Wouldn't you like to be strolling the streets of gold one day or going down to pick that fruit at that tree that grows all the time there, Brother Cliff? Yeah, right? Amen. <laughs> strolling along the street and you, you go along beside this guy and somebody says, hey, you know who that is? That's Barabbas. Amen. Wouldn't that be tremendous? Amen. I don't know. It's just conjecture on my part, so I won't give much uh, veracity or weight to my statements either, but wouldn't it be great? I have to believe that at some point Barabbas realized what had happened in his life. He yeah. took his place. Then the second part of Simon's name there, as he introduces himself in the book, is Simon Peter. We find this in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus gives him this nickname or um, this substitute name, Peter, a rock. As you think about Peter's life, he went through a transformation. He was not necessarily as steady as a rock when Jesus first took him from where he was. Neither were we, right? He was a rough fisherman. He had, at some times, great faith. Here comes somebody walking on the water in the middle of the night. The disciples are all afraid, and Peter says, If it's you, Lord, I'm paraphrasing here, let me get out of the boat and walk with you. Either he was crazy or he had a lot of faith, Brother Cliff. Yeah, right? Amen. And then at other times, he toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, I mean, can you hear this is like the pillar of faith. Can you hear this in the statement? Nevertheless, at thy will. I will let down that. That's not exactly stellar expression. Yes, Lord, I'm going to let down every head I have. If you said it, I'm going to catch as many fish. Nevertheless, at thy will. We, we understand that, right? We're human just like Peter was. Yeah. I will let down the net. He does, and it's such a great draw to fish, it almost sinks two boats. Yeah. And as a fisherman, as a commercial guy, I wonder if he's scratching his head at some point saying, why did we only let down one net? <laughs> he didn't have much expectation in that, did he? Not much faith. Peter, this is the Lord Jesus, the creator of the universe. He made all the fish and the sea that the fish are in. Amen. And you let down one net. No wonder your boat's about to sink. The Lord does that for us sometimes too, doesn't he? Yeah. I mentioned the accounts around the crucifixion. He warmed himself by the fire and with foul language denied the Lord Jesus who was being led away to die on Calvary for his sins. And yet, a little over a month later, with great boldness, now he's beginning to act a little bit more like Peter, isn't he? He stands up before much of the same crowd that cried all night, crucify him, crucify him. They falsely accused him. They had mock trials. They insisted that Pilate call him. He said he's king of the Jews. That crowd, Peter stands up and says in Acts chapter 2, listen, this Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Mm -hmm. And with great boldness, Thousands were saved. Yeah. In the very next chapter, Peter and John going up to the temple to pray. Remember that story? The book of Acts? Yeah. Here's a man that's been laid at this gate his whole life, begging alms. And Peter says, most of us can identify with this, silver and gold have I none, right? Yeah. But such as I have, seriously, I give unto thee. Yeah. Get up and walk. And the man walks, jumps, rejoices, leaping. Wouldn't you do that as well if you hadn't walked your whole life? He's not just going to stumble along. Right. He's watched people walk past him. Imagine, I was thinking about this as I was reviewing this illustration for the lesson from Peter's life. Imagine the years that that man had watched people walk past him. It says he was laid at the gate. He, if he couldn't walk, then very little chance that he did much standing as well. So he has a unique perspective on everybody that came into the temple for years from the knees down, right? Children skipping along, parents holding him by the hand. Be quiet. Strong men, fishermen like Peter, striding in with no thought about putting one foot in front of the other and just walking. Maybe skipping, if somebody like me is skipping every other step, right, up the steps of the temple. Older folks, having walked their whole lives, perhaps this lame man observed the well-worn knees and swollen ankles of older folks that have made many journeys laboring their way up the temple steps and into the temple to worship. Yeah. Perhaps he witnessed special events. 
new bride and groom walking side by side, you know, matching step for step. You've seen that happen, right? Miss Rachel, Mr. Bruce, they still do that, right? Just hold hands and walk along together. <laughs> and he could participate in any of that. Perhaps he saw some people come out, perhaps crowds of Pharisees and Sadducees talking with one another, sidestepping and, and moving, and never was able to do that. And then on this day, on this day, this guy, Peter, maybe you heard about Peter. Peter and John. Yeah, he was associated with that one Jesus. He said, get up and walk, and he did. And then he becomes, becomes before the same crowd again, this same group of these high priests and, and the ones that had had these mock trials for the Lord Jesus. And with threatenings that were very real. Remember, this was fresh in Peter and John. The rest of it was fresh in their minds. This threat was real. They had put Jesus on the cross. When they threatened him and said, don't do anymore, they had some teeth in that threat. And yet Peter says in Acts chapter 4, there's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. He says we can't help but speak the things which we've seen and heard. Now he sounds a little bit more like a rock, doesn't he? And he goes on throughout the book of Acts. I won't rehearse the whole book of Acts for you, but there's some meaning in his name as he introduces himself in this book, Simon Peter, where he came from, what God made of him, and then part of this study as well, what God has for him in the future. Yeah. Simon Peter. We'll take some more time to unpack those first four verses in lesson one next week, but let's move on this morning. Not only the who, but the what. What is this book about? And I don't want to pick apart every lesson this morning, but there are three pr primary themes, foundation, mm -hmm. faith, mm -hmm. and future. Foundation, faith, and future. That's the what of this little book. We find those things in the first few lessons, some foundational things that he reminds them of. Then we, we find that it requires the exercise of some faith. It's enough to know some things, but if we don't exercise our trust, our belief in those things. Right. James says, faith without works is dead. dead. And all this, as he closes the book, we'll get to this in a few weeks, hopefully. And we'll get to this. There is a future. Aren't you glad this is not it? Amen. I like my life, you know? It's yeah. really not so bad. It's not necessarily great having to wear a mask when it's 100 degrees outside to go to the grocery store. But you know what? Life is not so bad. That's right. But I'm glad this is not it. That's right. I'm glad this is not it. There's something better Amen. And Peter reminds us of that. It's you true. see, this is the whole point of Scripture. You probably have these verses memorized. You can turn there with me if you'd like. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I mentioned these verses to someone this week. I forget who it was, but anyway. Well, familiar verses that we've memorized probably several times. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, and it's in this order, doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, here's the future purpose that the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly, that means through and through, from the inside out, thoroughly furnished yeah. unto all good works. This scripture in 2 Peter is no different. It follows the same pattern, doctrine. Let me teach you some things, some building blocks. Um, most of us are not that far away from school that we remembered that before we could balance our checkbook, we had to learn that 2 plus 2 is 4. Four minus two is, it still works in your checkbook the same way, by the way. Amen. <laughs> right? Right. Before we could do the, the complicated applications, we had to learn the basics, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the little people that come to our house every day are in the process of learning to read, right? And the first thing you have to learn is that A says about 12 different things in the English language. No, it's, you know, A and then cat, right? And you put together, we're excited when they read to us three-letter words. The fat cat sat. Yes! And we give out M&Ms and all kinds of things, right? Right? <laughs> Chuck's going to come to our house and read. <laughs> but we have to learn those foundational things first, right? And then as we grow in our lives, we're able to apply those things. And we learn, Peter does the same thing. Right. He lays this doctrinal foundation. And then, as in all good scripture, there is some reproof. Here's where you've, you've gotten away from it. You know, part of going to school are red, I guess they still put red marks on papers for things that are wrong. Is it still okay to be wrong? You know, to have something marked wrong? I know we can't keep score at T-ball, but 
you know, it's okay if you get the problem wrong to be told that it's wrong, right? It's part of the learning process. Robin used to teach some upper level math, like advanced math, and there's like, what, two questions on the whole test? It takes you three class periods to complete those two questions. You can circle the room with chalkboards. And she would sometimes give partial credit because look, if you worked for 45 minutes on one problem <laughs> and you got off somewhere in the first 12 minutes, you know, you kind of can be discouraging if you get the whole thing wrong. So she'd give partial credit for some things, but she would, I remember watching her when she was teaching, mark things or circle them or, or make notes, this is incorrect, this is wrong. The word of God still is good for that. Yes. Regardless of what our world, our society says, it's okay to be told you're wrong not a bad thing right right but it doesn't stop there God as our kind Heavenly Father not only gives us instruction not only tells us when we're wrong but this next word in 2nd Timothy 3 16 is for correction that tells us how to get it right mm -hmm. that's an important step again to use our academic illustration if you get that problem wrong the right thing to do pun intended is to figure out why it's wrong right Perpetuating the error is not growth, it's stubbornness, right? But if you figure out, oh, I forgot about the exponent, right? Or in history, I got those two people confused, John Adams, John Quincy Adams. I still remember getting that wrong in a list of presidents on a third grade president's test. And to this day, I still think about that every time Let I think of it. I know. Let it go. <laughs> I know. It was right in this room right over here, beside the, the room right beside the uh, thrift store, that's where I had third grade. I mean, forget her name now, but anyway, I remember that test. I can show you the desk where I was sitting, facing that chalkboard, and I got my test back, and I had those two presidents mixed up. It's the only thing I got wrong on the test. Anyway, not that you care about that, but correction helps us get it right, and the Word of God does that. Second Peter does that for us as well, yeah, right? That's right. Helps us get it right, and then here's the part that keeps us from making mistakes in the future for instruction in righteousness. That's the overall, overarching reason that Peter and others under the inspiration of our God's Holy Spirit wrote these books to us to help us in apply the learning of God's Word so that we have this instruction in right living so that we can be freely furnished. So we'll find these things as we study through this book not only the who of Simon Peter, but these three main themes. We'll unpack them in separate lessons, but along these lines, foundation, faith, and future. And then when was this book written? If you read through it, I was reading through it several times this week again, and I thought, boy, it could have been written today, couldn't it? I mean, it's as relevant today as it was the nearly 2,000 years ago when Peter penned his words. Uh, but it was written, as we still call today, in the last days, the last days, not only in an overall sense, but in a personal sense. Let me show you what I mean. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Peter, in his perspective, realizes that he's running out of time. Here's what he says in verse 14. Knowing that, what's the next word in your Bible? Shortly. Shortly. I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Now, the Lord Jesus had given Peter some special encouragement that you're going to die for me. You've said you would, you will, right? Told him there as we close the book of John, his worry about, what about John? What about him? Jesus says, if he tarries till I come, don't worry about it. You're gonna die for me. I'm paraphrasing here, but he knew he was going, but in a broader sense, all of us know that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Lord Jesus has showed us that as well. The book of Hebrews says, it's appointed to man once to die. Peter, or Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Even the Apostle Paul says to the Philippians, to be departed be with Christ is better, but I need to stay here for you. And I will, he says, in spite of the difficulty, the imprisonment that he was actually under as he penned the book of Philippians. But Peter says this, and he knows this, and we reflect on this in a personal sense this morning, knowing that shortly I must put off. You know, it doesn't matter if we have our three score and ten. If as Moses said, by reason of years, we make it to 80, or Momo makes it to 87, right? That's still shortly yeah. in view of God's eternity. That's right. right. I mean, in a broad perspective, we're still only here for a blink of an eye. Amen. Sometimes we become our own world, don't we? And sometimes we need the perspective of a book like Second Peter to remind us that even though we are personally important to God, we are infinitesimally small. I was listening to 
um, Brother Cruz, Tim Cruz, this morning from China Valley Baptist Church down in Monroe, North Carolina. And he's given this illustration a couple times, and I think I shared some of it in our nursing home study several months ago about the, the heavens. It's estimated that just in our galaxy of the Milky Way, just in our galaxy, there are over 200 trillion stars. And he calleth them all, God calleth them all by name. That's right. And the Milky Way galaxy, I don't know how they know this, but scientists who study this stuff every day have estimated that there are upwards of 2 billion galaxies. And our Milky Way is just one of them with over 200 trillion stars. And yet God knows you. Amen. God knows me. Isn't that an amazing thought? I'm really not the whole world. But I'm infinitely important to God. So important that he sent his only begotten son Amen. to die for me. Knowing that surely I must put off this my tabernacle. Time is short. Yes. Peter says, what's important? Most Bible scholars agree that this is the last um, verifiable book or letter that we have written by Peter. That shortly after this, he was indeed crucified upside down because he refused to take the same honor that his Lord had being crucified right side up. So perhaps these were his last words. And I thought about this. We should each ponder on a regular basis. If this was the last thing I had to say to my loved ones, what would I say? If this were the last message to my friends, what would I say? I was thinking about Bobby Whitaker. 35 years old, Robin mentioned, you know, do you, at that age, have you planned for things like life insurance and end-of-life expenses? Probably not. You don't expect it to happen, right? I don't know what he was doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of last week, but Friday he had a seizure, and Robin said he never regained consciousness. Mm. Went out into eternity just a few days later. If the conversation I had with my loved ones, if this was the last one, if I know that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, what's most important? We have the privilege of reading here inspired scripture for all eternity of what was important to Peter. What God told him was important to Penn in his last words. But it's a sobering thought for us. I don't want to be morbid or, or fatalistic, but we should think often, if this was it, have I said the most important things? Have I written the most important things? You know, Perhaps it's a good reminder for us. You know, you can still write letters and put stamps on them, put them in the mail, and several days later they're delivered on you. <laughs> Shocking thing, right? There's these boxes in front of people's houses, red things on the side. You put those up, the car comes, picks them up, and a few days later they show up in somebody's other similar receptacle called the mailbox, right? Amen. We should perhaps take the opportunity to do that sometimes. But if I had one more opportunity, Peter says, shortly I'm going to go. But I want to tell you this now before I go. These are some important things that give some weight to the study of this book. But not only personally, but in a corporate sense as well. Turn with me over to chapter 3, last chapter. And we'll look at this in greater detail in a few lessons, actually several lessons in the future. But he's reminding us that not only will he soon pass and the Lord tarries his coming, we will as well, right? But even if we don't go by way of the grave, the trumpet could sound today. Amen. Verse 10, just to take one excerpt, and this whole passage is about this um, idea, but let's just take this one verse for sake of time. 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord, I like this very next word. What's the next word in your Bible? The day of the Lord will, will. will come. That's right. Do you hear the certainty in that? Sometimes we read that very quickly. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But it says the day of the Lord will come. It's a certainty. Amen. This is world is not forever. That's right. This letter was written, and he believed it the day that he penned this, again, nearly 2,000 years ago, he believed that it could happen that day, and it could happen today, just as real as it was 2,000 years ago. Yes. We'll study about God's long-suffering given us in verse 9, but verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, mm -hmm. in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. I don't know if you follow space kind of things. I've always been intrigued by it. In fact, I watched the, <clears throat> watched the launch of the SpaceX Dragon a couple months ago <clears throat> from Cape Canaveral. <clears throat> it was postponed over one day to the next day anyway. I, I get a thrill out of that kind of stuff. Well, today they're headed back to the earth, right? Mm -hmm. Supposed to splash down over near Pensacola, Florida. And one of the things that the space shuttle went through the same thing, everything that has ever come back from space to here has to endure this great 
fire, it really does. The vessel, the meteor, whatever comes in Earth's atmosphere, if you've ever seen a video of it or even a depiction of it, it's the thing is on fire. Yeah. And the astronauts are hopeful that all the engineers that worked on this had it right, right? Because one little leak and you're a goner. Yeah. I thought about that today. I think you're supposed to land later on this afternoon. Splash down in the Gulf of Mexico over there. Yeah. But I thought that is just one small demonstration of what God's holding in store, right? Mm -hmm. Again, when was this book written? Why are these truths so important? That's why I wanted to take this time to go over this this morning. Because these are the last days. That's right. Amen. I have to often remind myself, sometimes we can become a little complacent, can't we? And life is busy. I don't care if you're working or going to school or you're retired or whatever. I mean, days just fly by, don't they? They do. People look forward to, my parents say this often, people look forward to retiring. And then almost everybody I know that has retired says they're busier now. They don't know when they ever had time to work. Not me. Right? <laughs> I <laughs> with, with some exceptions, right? Do it, do it right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But many, if not most people who retire, very often say, I'm so busy now, I don't know when I had time to work, right? Mm -hmm. And much the same, you know, where my mom said this when she retired from school, for 46 or 47 years she taught school, and her whole life, she never, never not went to school. From the time she was a little girl, she went to school as a student, went right from that into college, from college into student teaching, student teaching, started teaching. And the very first August or September that she was retired, it was a revolutionary thing for her because she didn't, for the first time in her life, she didn't go to school. We kind of live our lives by schedules like that, don't we? Some, sometimes the same for work, right? We've gone to work our whole lives, then we retire and, wait, I don't go to work today? What, what, what do I do? And then pretty soon we figure it out and our time fills up. But before we know it, days go by, weeks go by, months go by. It's right. been six months now since this thing started, right? And it's, sometimes it seems as if it has flashed by, right? But we need to be aware that the trumpet could sound. That's right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. This could be the day. That's right. I was going to sing the song for you, but I'll spare you. This could be the day that the Lord will come again. This could be the dawning of that day. Still remember our choir singing that when I was a little boy, right? Great song. This could be the day. The day of the Lord, look at that verse again, will, will come. Be encouraged, Christian. Peter was writing this to encourage them as well. The day of the Lord will come. They had endured some persecution. They had endured some affliction. They were in a hard way. Their world was upside down. And we raised both hands, right? Peter says, the day of the Lord will come. I'm going, Peter says, shortly, the day of the Lord will come. And let me encourage you as we study this book to keep in our minds every day, the day of the Lord will come. He's got a plan. Yes. This is not it. That's right. There's something better. So number one, the who, we've looked briefly at Simon Peter. We'll take some more time to look at his life as we go through the series. Number two, the what? The foundation, the faith, and the future. Number three, when was this book written? In the last days. And then why? If we're going to read something, we should know why. Fortunately, Peter tells us why, and I'll summarize it this way, and we'll look at it again over the course of the series. Remember and revive. Remember and revive. Let me show you briefly what I mean. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, I kind of like it when you read a book of the Bible or a chapter in the Bible and the writer tells you exactly why he wrote this. And this, this is the case in 2 Peter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which... I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. I don't know about you, but I enjoy my Bible reading. I like, uh, Susan was talking about some of the devotion books that we've been waiting on, I guess shipping delays or whatever during this time, but I like, enjoy my devotions. I enjoy the perspective of the writers, but probably the thing I enjoy most about my personal devotions is just my Bible reading. It reminds me of things. I love, perhaps you have the same thing. I don't know if you mark your Bible, but I've underlined probably thousands of verses in my Bible. And very often as I read through those, my Bible reading schedule has taken me through the book of Psalms. In fact, it was rather apropos that as we finished the last series, I read Psalms, I think it was 35, 36, and 37, the same week that we had that last lesson, but we're in the 60s now, but whatever it is. But I've come across a verse that I underlined. Yeah. And perhaps you do the same thing. Perhaps not only its truth is brought back to your memory, but perhaps a situation in your life in which that verse had special meaning. 
Yeah. Why you underline that verse? Why you memorize that verse? I've got. I started doing this again for my mom. Um, some verses that are songs. I remember we're looking in my mom's Bible, and she had two little eighth notes, music notes, in her Bible in the margin. So I do the same thing. I kind of wondered why she did that. Now I know, right? So I do the same thing. If there's a song that's connected with that, I'll put them beside that verse. And sometimes we need that remembrance, don't we? Amen. We need to be reminded about how God worked in our lives. Sometimes I read across a verse and I'm reminded of conviction. Thank God for that, right? Amen. Sometimes I read across a verse and I'm reminded about some time when God worked in my life and encouraged my heart or brought me up out of a deep valley. You ever been across a verse like that? I've read that verse before. I've memorized that verse before, but this is a good remembrance. And Peter says, I want to write these things to remind you of some things that you should already know, but we're prone to forget, aren't we? Yes. Remind me, dear Lord. Show me where you brought me from, where I could have been. Right? Right. Amen. Remind me, dear Lord. Another great song, but um, he says, I want to remind you. And then uh, verses 17 and 18 down toward the end of the book. He doesn't just want to remind us. You know, sometimes we can sit and be reminded of things. But Peter says, I want you to be reminded and then act. Here's verses 17 and 18. The last two verses of the book. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before. The things that I've just reminded you of. This is the close of the book. Here's what you're to do. Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Here's how to keep from falling. You've been reminded of these things. Here's how to keep from being led astray. Here's how to keep from being fall from falling. Grow in grace. But verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Verse 18 used to be the theme verse of our Christian school here. It's probably printed in many yearbooks or annuals and other things as well. Um, over the years, but grow in grace. And of course, the meaning there was to grow here at grace, and many of us have over the years, but, but grow in grace. We should take the things that Peter's teaching us, the things that he's reminding us of. He wrote this to his readers in this day. Take those things and grow. It should make us, as he says in the middle of the verse here, want to know more. Grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus yeah. Christ. That word grow, if you want to diagram a sentence, things I remember diagramming. Do they still do that, Miss Rachel, in school? You know, I don't think ones. they do any of that. <laughs> really? What, work off the preposition? Uh -oh. Yeah, you know, you draw a line, subject, verb, prepositions. You didn't know the last page of the edition. They had a piece of paper with a table to figure it out. Oh, really? How sad. Anyway, if you were diagramming this verse, I digress, which is different from diagramming. But anyway, if you, if you were diagramming this, the, the verb grow applies to both of the direct objects. Grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Both apply. Grow in grace. Have a renewed appreciation. That's one reason I wanted to sing that song. Lord, awaken my heart. Re restore my slumbering spirit to be aware anew of your grace. Yeah, amen. I hope I never get over God's grace. How about you? Yeah. Hey. And I hope that spurs me to grow in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I should want to know more about him when I realize what he did for me. Amen. When I realize his grace and his mercy, I should say, Jesus, I want to know you a little bit better. Amen. Let me get a little closer. Amen. Amen. These are the last days. Yes, they are. I would like to hope that when I reach heaven, the Lord Jesus is not a stranger that I recognize. Amen. That's right. I'm not talking about with these physical eyes. But the moment I see the blessed Son of God, I hope that in my eternal then heart, I say, that's my Jesus. Amen. I know him. That's right. Hey, I may not recognize Elijah. I don't know what he looked like. I may not recognize Bartholomew. Brother Clue might, but not me, right? <laughs> but I hope I know the Lord Jesus. Don't you? Amen. And the way to do that is that he's revealed himself. He, the living word, has revealed himself in this blessed That's book. Right. Yeah, That's right. right. Lord, help me to know you yeah. a little bit better. Father, thank you again for this opportunity we have to study the word of God together. Thank you for the opportunity to jump into this new series of 2 Peter. Teach and instruct our hearts. Amen. Keep us safe and healthy and strong. And Lord, those that haven't been able to gather with us for a while, I pray that you'd soon be able to bring them back. And Lord, as we study this individually and personally, may it indeed help us to grow in grace. May it help us to grow in our knowledge of who you are. Remind us of some things. 
renew our foundation. Give us renewed faith. And Lord, as we look toward the future, may it help us to be energetic in our witness for Christ and enthusiastic in our living for Christ and our testimony each day. Bless as we study this series. We need your spirit to apply it to our hearts, and we know that only you can do that, and so we ask for it. Bless the remainder of this day as we fellowship around the word of God, as we offer to you our thanksgiving and our songs of praise. May you be glorified. May your people be edified, strengthened, and uplifted. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.